Have your family or friends ever told you that they don't believe in the Bible? That it's just a myth? The Bible tells us in Psalms 85 verse 11, Truth shall spring out of the earth. And now it has. RealDiscoveries.com presents amazing hard evidence concerning the stories of the Bible. For generations, the Holy Land has kept its secrets hidden. Secrets which strongly support the Bible's account of history. The Real Discoveries team dig deep in search of the truth behind the people and places described in biblical stories and unearth some truly breathtaking findings. Real people, real places, realdiscoveries.com. In Genesis 18 verse 20, the Bible tells of two cities named Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, Sodom and Gomorrah I will know. beside the Dead Sea which became so evil that God rained down burning sulfur upon them. The two cities were completely annihilated. Simon and a group of skeptics traveled to the Dead Sea in Israel to search for the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah. What they found left them speechless. Shapes resembling ziggurats, sphinxes and strange buildings lay amid a wasteland of ash and sulfur. Ziggurats Sphinxes. Journey with the Real Discoveries team to the destroyed cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and see for yourself the evidence that they truly were incinerated by God. Brimstone, bigger than any that Simon had found. Filled with excitement, everyone began looking under bushes. Suddenly, it was everywhere, like strawberry picking, bigger and bigger samples. Sixty-six samples were collected in all that day. Fired into the wall at a phenomenal velocity, the sphere burning at a ferocious heat had melted the wall around it, creating a brown husk before it was extinguished, starved of oxygen. Join the team as they take these deadly sulfuric missiles to be tested in the laboratory and witness for yourself the jaw-dropping results. So, back in the UK, Simon, Emma and Einar began the long job of evaluating what they had found at the Intertech Sunbury Technology Center. An X-ray fluorescent technician was to supervise an analysis of the brimstone samples. In order to provide a sample good enough for the precision of the X-ray fluorescent spectrometer to read, Andy had to be very thorough in his preparation. In short, Simon's brimstone samples were to be analyzed then the same tests would be conducted on sulfur flowers that had been chemically refined by laboratory methods. What was happening was difficult to grasp. But if you're finding it actually sort of embedded in, in the walls and things yeah, like that. to cut them out of the walls. Right. No. You might have to spend an hour cutting out right. uh, one out of, out of actual rock where it was just so embedded in the rock because right. you couldn't actually pull it out. Right. Yeah. I've got no. a prize specimen at home. So about the size of my fist. Right. And I cut it right out the rock and I stood right. in the rock, left it in there where it's come down. Right. And embedded itself 
Right. So it may have burned for some time within. Yes. Yeah, because the outside probably would be very hot and therefore it would yeah. burn there. Yes. No, I haven't seen anything like that. Hi, good evening, welcome to another live program, Revelation TV. Tonight's program is all about the search for Sodom and Gomorrah. I've got a couple in the studio tonight who uh, went out in search of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'll introduce you to them in a second. Arrange for it to be done. See them place. burn one of the bowls of sulfur sent down from the heavens to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Revelation what? Revelation 21, verse 7. Okay. It's mentioned there, the same sulfur that came down on these evil cities we're told that they will come down again in the future. Revelation uh, 21? Revelation 21, uh, verse 7. 7. Whoever comes will inherit these things. That's it. Okay. Carry on through then. Okay. But the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And this is the second death. That's correct. So here we're looking at uh, the lighting of one of these sulfur balls which was found um, way back, well it was originally landed somewhat three and a half thousand, four thousand years ago, was that the yeah, timing? about 3,900 years ago. Oh, 3,900 to be precise, yes, that's to the day. That's correct. And here you can see, the, uh, now you couldn't do this with a stone, could you? You couldn't make no. it burn. So this is quite unique. Bob, how unique is this? We're hearing it obviously from Simon and Emma, but... Well, the smell is pretty unique. I must is it? Admit. That's not me. <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, it, unique in that you wow. only find these balls apparently uh, in these five areas where the five cities would have existed. Mm. Normal oh, sulfur. It's a strong no, smell. It, it smells really like powerful. it is when you're in the Dead Sea. Yeah, you've yes. got that smell, haven't yes. you? Yeah. Wow. Uh, and these balls are only found in this area down by the Dead Sea. Usually sulfur is found in crystal form, but nowhere can you find it like this. So that makes it very unique. Oh, it is. Very strong, That's great. Well, very strong, isn't it? This, is, an, an, an this is the first time I've, uh, we've ever mm. had anything like this. Real Real people, real stories. Real people, real places. Realdiscoveries.com Journey on with the Real Discoveries team as they search for the true location of the tomb of Jesus Christ and the real site of his crucifixion. search for the tomb of Jesus. For centuries, some of the world's greatest explorers have sought the tomb of Jesus, only to stumble across as many questions as answers. Now a handful of believers seek the answers to those questions and the truth about possibly the most important archaeological puzzle in human history in an incredible new documentary feature by the Real Discoveries team. Led by 46-year-old former UK businessman Simon Brown are a tenacious group of explorers on a mission to prove the stories of the Bible. Fresh on the heels of their acclaimed films, Our Search for Sodom and Gomorrah and Our Search for Real Discoveries aired on Sky Television, Simon and his team set off in search of the final resting place of Jesus Christ. On their travels, the Real Discoveries team meet scholars and historians, scientists and archaeologists as they gradually piece together the mystery of the tomb of Jesus. Matching their real-world findings to details straight from the pages of the Bible, their new film, Our Search for the Tomb of Jesus, weaves an incredible tale that spans millennia from Constantine the Great to the Knights Templar to modern-day Jerusalem and the many secrets she still harbors. This new DVD includes brand new evidence never before seen on screen about the legendary tomb of Jesus Christ, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the famous Garden Tomb. Official Shroud of Turin photographer and renowned authority on the burial of Jesus, Barry Schwartz was so fascinated by the discoveries made by Simon and his team that he has indicated a desire to reopen his own investigations based on their findings. You're always skeptical, says Simon, but he's seen these things with his own eyes and he was amazed. He has a passionate desire to share their discoveries with people who may not fully realize the importance of the Bible and its message. Our search for the tomb of Jesus is available now online at realdiscoveries.com. The Real Discoveries team reveal, for the first time ever, incredible new scientific evidence that sheds light on the truth of the resurrection. 
share their exhilaration as they visit two tombs, believed to be the very tombs where our Saviour Jesus Christ was laid and later rose. Jerusalem has two sites, each of which is considered by Bible scholars and archaeologists to be the true tomb of Jesus. But they can't be both be the site. And why have the arguments about Jesus' tomb become so enmeshed with issues of doctrine? Could either of them truly be the tomb of Jesus? Find out as the Real Discoveries team explore the tomb of Jesus. Christians believe that Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha, outside the walls of Jerusalem on Good Friday. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Three days later, on Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead, leaving the tomb empty. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. The tomb is significant to Christians of all denominations because it is the site of Jesus' burial and of his resurrection. But whilst the Bible tells us about the events of Holy Week, after 2,000 years, we are less certain about where these events took place. The group decided it was time to investigate the other site, the Garden Tomb. There is no church just a quiet and peaceful garden. What evidence do we have that this is the tomb of Jesus? First of all, although there is evidence that early Christians believed this was the true site, it lay pretty well undiscovered until the middle of the 19th century. Until 1867, the site was a wasteland, and nothing was discovered until the Greek family owning the land decided to dig for water. They found a cave which they decided to excavate further to install a water cistern. The excavation took almost half a century, but in the end, the site was very much as we see it today. From time immemorial, it had been called Skull Hill, and Golgotha is Aramaic for the place of the skull. If we look at the site from here, 
we can clearly see the shape of the eye sockets and the nose. Gordon was sure that this was the correct site because St. John tells us that at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been buried. According to the Gospels, the tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy merchant who had the tomb made for himself and his family. The garden tomb is a short walk from the old city walls near the Damascus Gate and just around the corner is the tomb itself. City wall down there, that's Mount Moriah, the north end up there, and that's the skull over there. As you can see, the door into the tomb is quite small, but the tomb itself roomy, about 14 and a half feet by 10 and 7 and a half feet high, which is quite high considering that few men stood more than six feet tall. The entrance would be made intentionally small to deter grave robbers. To the front, we see the weeping chamber. The mourners would be women and on the right, here, a low wall hewn from the rock divides the room. Below, a pillow has been cut out of the rock and beyond, an unfinished tomb, perhaps intended for Joseph of Arimathea's wife. There is a small window in the outer wall. If you look up here, you can see what appears to be a window in the tomb. We're not actually certain what it was for. It could have been for ventilation purposes. On the, other on the other hand, some Jewish tombs of that period had a thing called a nefesh, a Hebrew word that means soul hole. And the Jews believed that after the body had been in the tomb for three days, the spirit departed through that window. Now it's interesting because if you remember, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, he waited for four days before doing it. Do you remember? Now, he waited probably for four days because had he done it earlier, people would have said the spirit was still in the body and he wasn't truly dead. So we believe that's why he waited. So it's interesting, isn't it? Now, the other interesting um, feature of this window is it allows light to fall on that grave there where we believe the body of Jesus would have rested. And that would explain why John was able to bend over and look in and actually see to the tomb and see the linen cloth lying there because I feel if it was one of those other tombs he'd be looking into a black hole and would not have been able to see. So again it does fit the biblical picture. The tomb is certainly large enough for Peter and John to enter it and find two angels seated where Jesus' body had lain, one at the head and the other at the foot. Only the finished localis, the grave area, looks to have been used and there is no sign that any other body was ever here. Covering the tomb that you can see in front of you, except that this right-hand side had collapsed, we think, due to earthquake damage, and at that time they strengthened it with these stone blocks. <clears throat> now, when you go into the tomb, don't think it's a, a natural cave that's been adapted as a tomb. It's not. It's been cut out of the rock, just as described in the Bible. And it's a large and impressive tomb, speaking of it being the tomb of a rich man like Joseph of Arimathea. A poor person couldn't afford a tomb of this kind. Now, when it was in use as a tomb, the entrance was much lower than you see it at the moment. We think it was only about a meter high. So you'd have to bend down to look into it or to go into it. And as you probably know, it was sealed by a large rolling stone, wasn't it? Now, we've never found that original stone, but it would have looked a little like that one behind you. Can you see that one there? That one's dated back to that period, so it gives you some idea of what it, what it looked like. Here are the chisel marks to show where the rock was hollowed out. The tomb was originally designed for someone 5 feet 8 inches tall, quite tall in ancient times. The localis has been hastily lengthened and the space is now something over six feet. It is believed that Jesus was around the same height as our cameraman, five feet, 11 inches tall. Now we come to investigate the area outside the tomb. 
there is a large cistern which confirms that it was almost certainly a garden in Jesus' time. The dry climate meant saving water for irrigation in underground containers in the rock. This cistern holds a quarter of a million gallons of water, the third largest in Jerusalem, and it must have been used to irrigate a large and luxuriant garden. If I could remind you of a verse in John's Gospel, do you remember? It says in John's Gospel that at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Now we've seen the possible site of the crucifixion at that place called Skull Hill. Here we are in a beautiful garden, but what's the evidence to say there was a garden here at the time of Jesus? If you look at this photograph, I think this shows you part of the evidence that tells us there was a garden here at that time. This is a very large water system. As you know, they dug them all over Israel in the past, didn't they? To store the rainwater in the winter so they had plenty of water for the dry season. This one, the head of it, is just over there and it goes deep underground. It's the third largest water system in Jerusalem and it takes about a million litres of water and it's been dated back to pre-Christian times, so it's over 2,000 years old. So it was certainly here at the time of Jesus. Now the discovery of this system and also an ancient wine press that's been found here tell us this was a garden at that time, not the sort of garden that you're looking at now, but we believe it was a cultivated area and uh, we think it was probably a vineyard for growing grapes with lots of water in this to water those grapes. Now because it's so extensive it also suggests that it's a garden of a rich man like Joseph of Arimathea. We know he was wealthy, don't we? The Bible tells us. And if you remember, he and Nicodemus, they'd both become secret followers of Jesus, hadn't they? But in the end, they had the courage to come out in the open and they went to Pilate, the Roman governor, asked for his body, and the Bible says they buried him in Joseph's own new tomb. So all the three things described in John's Gospel are found here on this site, so you can see how well it does fit the biblical account. Just such a garden as would belong to a wealthy merchant like Joseph of Arimathea. Yards away we have a wine press which must have been used for the garden's fruit. It was there before Jesus' burial and is one of the largest ever found in Israel. The cistern and the wine press are circumstantial evidence, but the most telling piece of evidence is just outside the tomb. St. Matthew tells us that after Jesus' body was prepared for burial and the disciples had sent their farewells, the tomb was closed by rolling a huge circular stone across the entrance and sealing it in place. The heavy stone and seal were fitted on the orders of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Here's the entrance, and outside it, the great stone with its guide track for rolling it into place. Once the stone was rolled along the guide track, completely covering the entrance, it stopped. We can see the ledge that stopped it to the right. To the left hand of the entrance, there is evidence that a metal spike was driven into the rock at a height of 71 inches. Whilst later critics doubt its authenticity, there is plenty of evidence that early Christians believed this the right place. The walls inside the tomb have red crosses etched and painted into them, together with the Greek symbols for Alpha and Omega, which Jesus, with the phrase, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, was used as a metaphor for him. The team visited the Jewish National and University Library in Israel to confirm the date of these ancient maps. Dated 1584, 300 years before the garden tomb was discovered. How did the printmaker know of these locations? Both these sites were covered in rubble and not fully excavated until the 19th century. The city boundaries have changed and the walls have been rebuilt. But if we remove this section, we find Golgotha, both on a corner and outside the city walls, 
exactly where it should be according to the Gospels. On a hunch, Simon contacted 10 scholars who over the years have worked on the Turin Shroud. There were many questions he wanted to ask, but one held the key for him. How tall was the man in the Turin Shroud? The first reply dropped into his email box in just an hour. In reply to your inquiry, the height of the man in the Turin Shroud is 5 feet 11 inches. A tall man, then, would fit into the hurriedly altered tomb. The extra inches would accommodate Jesus rather than the 5 feet 8 of Joseph of Arimathea. This was most exciting news for Simon. Authorities. Then Jesus came, stood among them. Peace be with you. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Peace be with you. Put your finger here and look at my hands. Then reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. My Lord and my God. Do you believe? Because you see me. How happy are those who believe without seeing me? <laughs> 